Hey everybody, welcome back to Mob Vlog. Today uh, is, is a really great day. It's April the 6th. 6th. April 6th already. I can't believe March is gone, Red. It's April 6th and it's Redness Day. And welcome back, guys. It's um, Mob Vlog. So we had John Drummond on a couple of weeks ago, and most of you know who John is, uh, and an unbelievable interview. And so at the end of it, I said to John, maybe we could have you on again. And he said, let's do a rematch. So today is the rematch. Welcome back for John Drummond. For nearly 30 years, legendary reporter John Drummond was best known for covering the city's top lawbreakers, but his resume spanned far beyond the underbelly of Chicago's organized crime. Tonight, a look back into some of John Drummond's most memorable stories. When Charlie was released from prison, we were there to ask him if that was true. Nine years after the Pure Later heist, that, that there's a million dollars missing in you. I'm John Brummer. Red Wimet, welcome back. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. I heard you had a little something done here and on your thing. How did that go? What's going it's on? It's fine. The other okay. side. I took the stitches out myself. <laughs> oh, so no big deal. You're healing up and uh, you're feeling this one better. comes out in two weeks. There you, ooh, that's a long one right there in the back of your hand. Right? Yeah, there's about, I don't know how many stitches, over a couple hundred stitches underneath it. I well, know hey, everybody in the comments I've seen are all rooting for you and are hopefully uh, uh, you're on the mend and hoping they're uh, wishing you well. Uh, so it's great to have a lot of a lot of people thinking about you. I had a lot of people say thanks to me on Facebook. It was great, Mr. John Drummond. Welcome back, sir. Thank you, sir. But before I say anything else, I didn't know that Red was a bit under the weather. I hope he comes back uh, better, as stronger than usual. So let's uh, have good luck to you, Red. But uh, we we talked about that that promo at the start. Memorable stories. We're going to give you a story tonight. I consider very memorable, but was not in that cachet of stories we had that time when it aired in the special. So when you guys are ready, I'm ready for action on that. Oh, well, Shoot, John. We'll... Go ahead. Give it to it. <laughs> we... All right. We're going to give you a story about a guy that probably won't ring a bell to many of it, but you should. He is a guy that had, <laughs> with his record, he was a professional criminal, but a very, a very a, a articulate guy, a very sharp guy, and a very ruthless guy. I'm referring to a man by the name of Henry Gargano, which probably won't ring a bell, but give you, when he was 14 years old, his first score was 130 pounds of butter from a store. You say, what kind of a palooka is this? At that time, World War II was on, and butter and things like silk stockings and gas and things were hard to get that were rationed. So he knew where the money was, and that was it. But he also pulled some bank jobs when he was a kid. But he also had a pension to get out of jail. He got bust out. He tried to get out of, I think, the Metropolitan Correctional Center one time. He went to Lewisburg in Pennsylvania, a federal institution, and he tried to get out there but did not make it. But he served his time there, and it's about time he figured to his Confederates, hey, this is time for a big score. Not these minor scores anymore. He had two guys that went, got discharged from when he did, when their time was up there on parole. A guy named Del Rain, who was a ruthless, pretty tough guy himself, who, by the way, later ended up in Florence, Colorado. And you can't do that any tougher than that. It's the toughest federal prison in the country right now. And another guy by the name of Clifton Daniel. So they got out together, and, and Gargano says, look. I grew up in, the, in Chicago. Actually, he was on Polk Street, but on the west side. He said, I know there's this bank in North suburban North Lake. They got a lot of money in that place. We're going to hit it. But before they did, they drove first to Canton, Ohio. They pulled a nice score. They uh, had a super, I should say, a shopping center there. Got away with some merchandise and mainly some cash and shot two co cops while they were at it. Not killed them, but they shot them. On then their next step was to go to Springfield, Illinois. Not to do for a big score, but to get to some. Uh, they wanted to get some Browning automatic rifles. They wanted to be break, they wanted to be like the Fifth Army, ready to go into action when they had to. And from there, they drove up to North Lake. They went to the bank at North Lake. 
This is October 1967. I'll date this. They walk into the bank in what the FBI would call a takeover job. People, they jump up on the, on the, on the counter and take this as a job with brandishing weapons that scare the blazes out of anybody in the bank. And that's what they did. They got something like $87,000 on that haul, which and you say, well, that's peanuts. Well, it wasn't in 1967. That's pretty good, though. But what happened? One of the tellers uh, hit the silent alarm. And by the time these guys had scooped up all the money, there was a whole bunch of squad cars pulling up in front of the bank. The third man, Daniel, who was one of the three guys with the Gargano, panicked. He either had a rifle or shotgun and shot out at the cops who missed him and hit Gargano. That triggered a raid from Gargano. He pulled up by a squad car, shot it out with a couple of cops who got out of their squad car. And he, according to witnesses, after he, after he wounded both of them, they hit the deck on the, on the pavement, came up and, and finished him off, gave him the coup de grace. So there was two cops killed there and two others were wounded. Del Rain, the guy that was a tough guy and ended up in, in Florence, was captured. But uh, Dergano, although he was wounded, uh, was uh, escaped along with this guy, Daniel. Now, here's the stuff. This stuff sounds like fiction, but it's not. He he had a girlfriend he wanted to contact to escape with her, with her. She was a stripper. I think it was a silver slipper or some name. It was Kitty Corner from the police station, 11th and State, for God's sakes. He rendezvoused with her, and they went over to Fish Lake, Indiana, which is near LaPorte, and hung out there figuring nobody was going to find us. Well, it turned out that Daniel apparently had read it on him and called the authorities. And I talked to the guy that led the raid on that house at the, at the cabin. At the Dick Scalini was an FBI agent, veteran FBI agent. And they admitted going in to get Gargano was not, even though he'd been wounded. That's not easy to do. Everybody had their know that Gargano was going to shoot it out. Well, they went to the place, and here's Gargano, wounded badly, lying in bed with a sheet over him. They pull the sheet off him. What is he? He's, he's cradling a 38 in his crotch area. And he mumbles something like a Jimmy Cagney movie or Edward G. Robinson movie. You covers, if I if we hadn't been, sh- I wouldn't been shot, and you never got me alive, but I gotten a lot of you guys. Well, we got to do something about him right away. They figured that the, the Justice Department, they, they convict him 199 years in prison. What are we going to do with this guy? He's going to, he's escaped, or he's, he's prone to escape from anywhere he goes. Let's put him in the Marion. Now, Marion at that time is a prison, in, well, still there, of course, in southern Illinois, in Williamson County. At that time, it was the new Alcatraz. You may remember that Alcatraz was closed in 1963. It was a financial burden for the government to keep the rock going. The people who were at the rock were sent then to Marion. Plus, anybody was, uh, was a, a bad, as, as, a, as the warden told me, he said, we get all the bad apples here. Guys that they can't control in other prisons, they come to Marion. Well, we don't have to worry about our friend Gargano anymore. He's locked up for good. October 1975, we fast forward to about eight years. I get the phone, a phone rings in, the, in my house early in the morning. Get your rear end down to Miggs Field. You've got to fly down to Southern Illinois. Well, what's going on? They've got a jail escape at Marion. I said, don't tell me who I think I know it is. You're right, Gargano is leading them. Five guys got out. Nobody could ever get, it was escape proof. Nobody got out of Marion. And he did it. What happened, they were had some electronic genius with them, I think, to one degree, that I think what he did to get out of that, that cell block, they had a remote control device that opened the, the door, the, the cell doors, and they got out, and they ended up in the uh, administration building. On, at night, this was, and what was going on at the administration building, where you get out, that's the main door, was a group of, of uh, bird watchers from um, Williamson County, which is near Marion. And they walked right out of the place, <laughs> The toughest prison in America. They didn't even notice. Even they left, and they had no big searchlight up on top of the uh, of that administration building. That's what changed. They all got away. They all went their various ways. Some of them were, a couple were caught right away. They they overpowered. They stole some cars and were in some farmers' houses. No question about it. I never saw so many police. Uh, mass, when I talk of a massive police search, when we got down there, we got out of a plane at Mount Vernon. We got our car and. It, Fifth Highway 57, Interstate 57, riddled with cops. They had every county road slammed. I'm talking about sheriff's department, police departments, FBI agents. I don't know if there's ATF guys or not. They even checked every train that went out. Now, there's no amp- and there was no passenger trains going out. But a, a, any freight train going through that area was halted. And they went in and looked at the boxcar to see that Gargano and company were not there. I get a call after they got two of these guys. And the call comes, get your... You know, uh, come on up. They were cooperative. They, meaning the authorities, were cooperative with. Get downstairs. With, we think we got Gargano co- cornered in a, a little farm field. Actually, a corn, a corn field really was part of the guy's property. I get down there. It looked like the Fifth Army was floating around all over the place. They had surrounded the corn field and had a chopper in front of it with a bullhorn guy saying, come on out. We know you're there. Come on out. 
like, oh, you're not sure they get killed. And I said to one of the angels, aren't you guys going in there? They said, are you crazy? That's Gargano. <laughs> they were smart. <laughs> now, try this one on for size. They couldn't, couldn't find him. He got out. He slipped out of that, 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 that enclave. How did he do that? I don't know. And it wasn't until some days later that he was caught wandering down the, on the uh, south of, uh, southeast of uh, Terre Haute in Indiana. He was staggering around uh, train tracks, weak, saying, I need water, I need food. And some gandy dancers saw him, and uh, he, he turned himself in, and he was apprehended and turned back to Marion. End of story, not quite. Then I did several stories in Marion. One was a, one of the guys that got out, a guy named Arthur Mankins, and his, uh, he had killed an FBI agent in North Carolina. Remember, anybody doing time at Marion that time was a hard-nosed guy. These are not guys that are doing white-collar crimes by any means or anything like that, or heist at a gas station. It was a little bigger deal than that. And I remember even Mankins talking about the highlight of his life. Think of this, guys. The highlight of his life, he says, you know what we did? Said, nobody could get out of this place, and by God, I got out of here. Of course, he was apprehended. Then I ran in, I come up back to the cell, walking around looking for some interviews, what more to do before he pulled out. There's Gargano talking to a couple guards. I came up, introduced myself. He says, I know who you are. And I told him, I said, I like to, I understand. I was told this by a guard that he was planning to write a book about his exploits, if I can use that term. And I said, you know, uh, Mr. Gargano, what you did was some years back, you got to keep your name in front of the public. And I'm offering you, and I was able to do this. I know they could call the station. You, if you inter- we can do an interview with you. I'll give guarantee at two and a half minutes on the 10 o'clock news and then more time the next day on six o'clock. You know what he said? Well, he said, what you do is write me a letter and I'll tell you whether I'll do it or not. And I'm going to read from the letter they sent me. You won't believe what he said. Now, this number, here's a guy who had limited education. Maybe did he get to eighth grade? I don't think so. Now, unless somebody wrote this letter, he's asking for money. He says, I would consent to such an interview only if I received monetary remuneration as I happen to be in need of funds to assist me with several liter- literary projects in which I'm currently involved. Now, that sounds like some professor of English at Harvard University. I go, what's on? And he goes on to the story. He talks about the, the shooting, which he called like a firefight. He does not feel that he was a rat when he shot those two coppers on the ground. He did. He had no choice. He said, uh, they said it, it was like a firefight in Vietnam, where the guys were blasting away at each other. And he said about the escape, he called it, although it's a Mission Impossible type of caper, utilizing James Bond gadgetry, conceived by some of the most brilliant minds at Marion, and executed by some of the most desperate. Once the escape was accomplished, it was more or less after that anticlimactic. In other words, he was very proud, and rightfully so, I guess you could say that, that he had busted out of Marion, the toughest pen in the country. Now, here's one other point before I dry up on this thing. About, uh, to make a long story short on the, on the interview, the station refused to pay any money. So we never, I wrote back and he was not interested unless it was cash on the barrel head. But I noticed what he was, what he would do. He could schmooze guards. Because one of the guards told me what he would do. One of the guards that day, his daughter had graduated from Southern Illinois University, Garbage Head. And, uh, uh, and Gargano comes up to him and says, geez, I'm really happy to hear your daughter or whatever it was got out of Carmadale, majored in biology. I'm sure she'll go to graduate school or get a very good job. You got, Mike, you got something to really be proud of. There was another guard whose wife had been had, uh, now with breast cancer. And Gargano came up and said, I want to listen, I want to stop you, Joe. He says, I've heard what you're having going through right now. Your wife, Helen, has got breast cancer. I can't do much about it. I don't have a wife. I don't know what it would be like, but I can imagine it's terrible. Your, my prayers are with you on that. Just believe me, my prayers are with you on that. So these guys were together. Hey, you know, this guy's not a bad guy at all. Well, that's what he did. He's, he's a smooch artist. Well, he finally gets out of Marion, not quite done with the story, eventually ending up in Turo, the federal prison in Turo, Indiana, after a few stops in, uh, down in Lompoc and a few other places. He's up for parole finally, even though he got a 199-year sentence. So what the parole board would do in those days, in the federal level, would go down and send somebody from the board to go down and interview that individual who's applying for parole and come back with a recommendation. The board does not have to take that recommendation, but usually they do. So a female woman, a woman went down there from the parole commission to uh, interview him, and Gargano must have, must have smoothed her plenty. She came back and recommended that Gargano be freed on parole. And that story would have ended there, but what happened was that uh, North Lake Police Department, Chief Neeson, find out that he had was ready for parole. They contacted some of the victims, that is, the, the wives of the uh, deceased cops, coppers, and of course they put up a big beef, and Gargano never, never got out of jail. 
Parole was denied by the board, and then several years later, he died of a heart attack at the age of 79. So that's the end of a story that, you, that Hollywood have loved, a Jimmy Cagney-type guy, or a Edward G. Robinson, but a very unusual man, but a very bright man. That too bad. John, uh, John uh, was it, wasn't he the reason Marion went on lockdown? Yeah, well, that was one of the reasons, correct. The reader just pointed out here, that was that Adam. What happened after that, Marion was put on lockdown for 23 hours. Toughest pet in the country. In other words, the men got out to take walk around, stretch her a little for an hour, and they went back in. And the place was really, it was, it was laid out a lot of the John Howard's Association, which is a penal group here in Chicago. Rays came with a lot of people. They became, and they became known as the toughest, toughest prison in America. They had that. They were absolutely correct. They said, nobody else is getting out here. And since that time, nobody has. Although now, it was called a level six prison. That's as high as you got in the federal level. Five, and probably was Leavenworth or Atlanta. Now, Florence, Colorado, they built a new prison out there. That's level six. I think that Marion is down to level five right now. But at its time, that was the new Alcatraz and was the toughest prison in America. As the warden told me, we get all the rotten apples here. That's how it is. <laughs> you know, I, it's funny you know, that you brought up Florence because yesterday I watched a video about, uh, about Florence, Colorado, uh, Supermax there, and how they have to, they spend twenty three hours a day in a cell by themselves, solitaire. Yeah, they're that's correct. They have a, they're perpetually on lockdown, pretty much. And so that's right. And then they're let out for an hour a day into what they call the the uh, underground room or something like. It's like they're let out into a, a space so they can run around because their cell's only like seven feet by twelve feet or something like. They that. They give them a little exercise, I understand. Just like Marion, you could go out. They had weights and that. I saw it in the yard. They have them do that. What? But under the lockdown, they didn't get to go out and use the weights. They had a little confined area to do like they were at uh, at Florence. And I know that, I remember Jimmy Marcello was there for a while. Whether he's still there or not, I don't know. He was later, he was uh, convicted back in Family Secrets. And uh, he was there. Whether he's still out there anymore, I don't know. And, uh, he's still there, John. Barlow still there. didn't go there. He went to a place, uh, to a, like a farm outside of, Marion, of, outside of Florence when he had some problems out at uh, Butner in North Carolina. But it's a tough place. Let's put it this way. I, I think I, I don't want to spend any time in Florida. So that's a tough time. That'd be a good way to deter crime if everybody had to go there. I'll tell you, you don't get no slap on the wrist from from these judges that way. Probation. They don't worry about probation or 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 family working out a community service. That, that that word doesn't come out to those guys. They got to do time. I was told by BOP they're not allowed to have any letters. They're not allowed to have any magazines. They're not allowed to any phone calls. Not even attorneys to visit. I didn't. I know that they're very tough on them, whether about the make them literature and that. I I know it's tough. They're very on phone calls. It's very very limited. I know that much. But I hear it's tougher. It's tougher. You don't want to hang out. You don't want to go to Florence. That's for sure. Just tell your listeners and viewers that that's not a good place to go. I believe me from what I've heard. Well, that prison I haven't been in. I was in Marion four or five times. Different stories down there. That was tough enough. But this place is maybe even worse. I don't know. Although they, I can't be any worse because that was a level six. They got the toughest cons of the country there. Gotti was down there for a while, by the way. We never got a chance to marry him. He's on the but he died at Marion, then he died at Springfield, the medical hospital at Springfield, Missouri. But he was at Marion, and they had some other guy. They had a lot of outfit, got big shot guys. That guy Persico from uh, New York, one of the New York families was down there walking by his cell one time, but he didn't want to do an interview. I remember that. But they had their share of uh, also some guys involved in espionage were down there as well. So Marion was no was no uh, was no country club, to put it mildly, like some of these prisons are, some of the federal prisons are. That's not in that case. It wasn't Eglin. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> it wasn't Eglin Air Force Base. No, that's what the red is talking now. That, that <laughs> Eglin, had, by the way, is uh, uh, was an Air Force Base. It's now I, my, the last I heard, of course, is the Bureau of Prisons place, and uh, they, had, they did have a nice golf course there. One of the uh, the cons and a big job there is to rake the traps, I guess. But I got a letter from time another. A lot of those institutions later became taken over by by the. Bureau of Prisons. One was Maxwell in, the, in in Montgomery, Alabama. And I got a letter from an inmate there. To, that is after the Bureau of Prisons took it over. And he was he described to me life down there. He, he says he's all that's doing time. Time. He said well, this is a farce. These guys. I mean, they ate like kings. And but but Oxford forgot. At one time, if you were on the camp at Oxford, you could wear civilian clothes at night. 
something. So some of those, some of that doing hard time. Duluth is another. Duluth is another one you find so many. Well, Ashford at one time was almost a suburb of Chicago. There's so many politicians in that there. You go up there and look at that prisoner list. You say, hey, what what ward are these guys from? What it is? And Duluth had a lot of them up there as well. And Walker did time. The governor Walker was there. I remember up there. And so was several aldermen. And one of them complained about all. He learned what he learned up at Duluth. He said, I improved my bowling game and learned how to work a computer. So if that's doing hard time, that's not my definition of hard time. At those, those are camps. <laughs> those places are. Uh, so, so uh, I I got a couple of questions here the from the yes, from sir. the audience, John. Um, Larry Newman. There's a fascination Larry Newman, with Larry Newman. Was he he was locked up in Joliet for his first murders, right? Yeah, that was back. He killed. No, he killed the three people up in McHenry County. That apparently he had his girlfriend were involved. I know that it's very hard to remember what happened, but this was 1956 and he killed three people. The reason I mentioned Larry, you mentioned Larry Newman, there's a guy I did sit down and we had a very lengthy interview with, but he became more well known. He finally got out of that, but the fact that he was a member of the Hole in the Wall gang in, um, in Las Vegas working for Spilatro. And he was one of those guys that was arrested when they were up on the roof of Bertha's. Uh, this, this play, Bertha, was it Bertha's Jewelry Store, whatever it is, yeah. and they're on July 4th, and they all got bagged. And he came back here and said, why did you interview him here? Because he was, even though he was in federal custody, they also had a state case against him that he had murdered a jewelry a jewelry store operator on, on Belmont Avenue. Bob Brown. And he came, and I went got to interview him through his lawyer, Larry, Mr. Adam Bourgeois, and I was stunned by his articulous, his very articulate, sharp guy. And I was told later that he had... Uh, when he got like a, he had almost a, not like a not a pension or not or not, but he had actually some money coming in all the time, and there, there was no reason that he had to be involved in a life of crime. But he liked the excitement apparently of that. And I recall when we did that interview with him at the time, that he said, "Look, he admitted to doing a lot of things, like the killing of three people in Las Vegas. I mean, in, in McHenry County in 1956." He mentioned some other stuff, including working for Spilatro, But he said, "I did nothing to do with that jewelry murder." I'm getting bum wrapped on that. He said, I'll probably never get out of jail anyway, so I got no reason not to, to lie about it. And he actually convinced me that he didn't. But unfortunately for Larry, he said, spent the rest of his life in prison and he died. Uh, I think he was, when he was in his 70s when he passed away. But physically, he was a very imposing guy. Let me tell you that right now. A very big, powerful guy. You wouldn't want to cross him by any means. Well, what's I know he was unhappy. I know he was unhappy when, what's his name, uh, tattled on those guys out in Vegas. Uh, and I think he'd like to get his mitts on him. It did that. Yeah. But how did the viewer? Now, did that viewer, or that listener, call in and mentioned? Uh, did he know Larry Newman? I said, well, not many people remember Larry. That's why I'm sort of surprised. Yeah. Well, Joe Joe Collada's on the channel right now. Uh, that's Fra Frank's brother, and he said that's right. It was Frank that I have to be honest with you. Larry did not. I don't think at the end he was too happy to, uh, with Frank. He'd like to got because as you know, Frank cooperated with the authorities, as you well know. Mm -hmm. Uh, so Joe said he killed three people in Chicago and two people in McHenry, right? See, two? I thought it was three in McHenry, but I'm not going to argue about it. But he was yeah. he was very feared. He was a feared guy. There's no question about it. And doing that interview, I could see that. I mentioned one guy, not Colada, but somebody else. I heard you were hot about this guy, and he took he I, he changed personality overnight. I said I think I'll drop that subject. I thought, I thought he might be flipping out of the cell, but anyway, Newman, <laughs> I'm sure that uh, Mr. Colada. I probably met him, and he probably knows what I'm talking about. He was a very physically imposing guy, Larry Newman. Was. Oh, gosh, yes. All right, here's a great question for you. Have you uh, any? Was there ever any criminal that you interviewed that left you feeling afraid? Well, not. I don't think so much. Uh, uh, so much as of organized crime people. But during the uh, '70s, when we had these airline takeovers, you had some Croatians and some of those people taking over air, uh, some in, in, up at O'Hare, you had commandeering planes and things of that nature. I ran into one of those groups one night and uh, they were they weren't going to surrender. I don't remember the circumstances at the time, but I remember he said, we don't care. He said, we don't care about uh, what happens to anybody. And that includes you, Drummond, Mr. Drummond. We don't care at all. We said, we're getting a problem here. We could take every, you'll go down like the rest of us. So I felt <laughs> that was the case. And I was also threatened one time, this was down to Palos Heights, I did a story of a guy that uh, went off his rocker. That's what I, let's phrase it, that's what it was. The guy had a mental problem and he killed a couple of people. I went down, did the story. Anybody could have done it. They sent me down there. I worked with him, but the information I had from what I got from the authorities and maybe a neighbor or two and mentioned that he had mental problems. By the time I got back to the station, there's cops all over the place. I thought, that's what's going on here. And they, the general manager, 
that time was concerned. He got the call, apparently, that this guy was real. He said, hey, I'm going down, coming down and kill Drummond. But, uh, well, it didn't happen. The police, uh, that is the bailiff's authorities, finally reached him and pointed out to him that, uh, that uh, he was going in the wrong direction. And he realized he kept his mouth shut. And so nothing nothing happened. So whether he was uh, the real McCoy or not, I don't know. But, he, but apparently they convinced, number one, the people at the station and convinced some of the authorities down in the bailiff's area that he was for real in that, but changed his mind. There was nothing we did about that. There's bum rap in the sky. We're telling what happened to him. And that was the end of that. So those are the only ones that really the threats, that kind of threat would come, not so much from outfit guys, but uh, a lot of people that are off, half off their record to begin with. Who, who knows when you're dealing with some of those guys that are killers, you know what they're going to do. Sure, I'd imagine that. that Unfortunately, was... there, was no, there was no reward. Well, wait a minute, I take it back. If that would have happened, hey, that's nice for a family guy because you got double indemnity. Supposing this guy worked, when I think that was his name, whatever it was, got up there and banged away at me, put me six feet under. I would, uh, the family, would, we got uh, our insurance policy was a double indemnity. If we died in the line of duty, so to speak, we get extra, double, double the insurance on us. So there's good, good or bad things about that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so- I, I tell you what happened. I'll give you a story about that. When we covered uh, Bill Dauber back in July of 1980 down at the Will County Courthouse. He came out of that courthouse with his wife. as a nondescript me, uh, affair, but uh, we wanted to get some video of, 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 of uh, Mr. Dauber and his, not his wife, but his, his him. He came out very subdued that day. It was different. They just walked right by. He wouldn't hardly say anything. Usually he'd, he'd get hot. On this, he wanted to beef with him. Got in his car and he took off. And I wanted the crew that I was with ahead me to come back and do another story because that it was all I wanted to get down and make sure we get a picture of the guy. A new picture of and I called the station. No, no, you got to come back. He said, here's all, I, all I'm asking to do is to send that crew to, they're just left there. He's going out to Crete. I think that's where he's got that new place, but I hear it's like a fort. Had the crew go down that road and get a shot of that uh, of that uh, home that, that, that Bill Arbor's in now, because it looks like a fortress. No, we can't use them. We have to go. And, the, and that was the road that, of course, had the crew followed, gone out at that time. They'd arrived on the scene just after Darber had been killed or while it was going on. As I said to those guys, they didn't appreciate that. I said, look, you got a good deal you're in. Number one, if you'd have got the picture of the shooting and got these guys, you would have gotten every kind of award the country the business is in. Oh, my gosh, they'd have been wonderful. And they said, if you do, if the cop, if they turn their guns on you because you, you, you could tattle on them and tell who they were, your wives would get double indemnity. So it's a, it's a no, no lose situation. They didn't think that was so funny, unfortunately. <laughs> But we never followed the crew. To make a long story short, we never followed Dauber down there. Uh, that is, nobody did. So we never got the pictures. Only the pictures after the scene had happened. The car there it was gone and everything else, except the car, the Dauber car, where they got shotgun. The death was there, but the the killer car was gone. Well, what happened? We went out and they were waiting. They, meaning the killers, were waiting in front of that Will County Courthouse that July afternoon, waiting for uh, Dauber to come out. And they decided to follow him down and take him out there rather than in front of the in front of the, uh, the, the county courthouse. Wow. But Dauber was a pretty tough customer. All right. I want to ask you a couple of questions, John, about Sam Giancana. But first, okay. before we jump into that, guys, hit the like button. If you're coming into the room, be sure to smash it. There's uh, 130 of you in here right now. Just smash the like button. Get it out there in the YouTube, al- YouTube algorithms for us. And uh, if you're in Vegas, you have to come do the Vegas Mob Tour. We're open. We're running right now. And, uh, and, and Big Tuna. Guys, I don't know if but Big Tuna's watching right now, but Big Tuna, he sent his little sister out here. And he played this little Snapchat video for me, and it's Big Tuna going, hey, you better give my sister a good tour. It's your thumbs, all right? It's your fucking thumbs. You get it? So, so I just I want to say thank you for sending your sister out here. We had a great tour. Here she is. Hey, guys. Welcome back. It's Adam here, and we just got done with the Vegas Mob Tour. And I have with me Ashley and Matt. Matt. Ashley and Matt Floyd, right here. Just in this Ashley right here? Yeah. She's Big Tuna's little sister. Oh, yeah. Big Tuna sent her out here on the tour. What'd you guys think of it? It was, it was awesome. Phenomenal. A lot of cool stuff to see. Yes, it was awesome seeing all the sights and everything. Like, pretty realistic. Very realistic. Awesome. Thanks, guys, for doing the tour. And uh, you guys get out here to Vegas. Come do the tour. Thank you so much, Thank Adam. You. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah. Heard a lot about that tour. Unfortunately, I haven't been out to see that. There was two of them, but you got the real good one, the real McCoy, from what I understand. Does Archer Goodman have anything to do with that or not? The former mayor? Oh, uh, the former mayor, uh, who was the mobster's attorney, who said right, he was Spilatro's attorney, among others. Quote, That's correct. Yeah. Quote, quote, he said, "There is no such thing as the mob. 
And then Oscar said, I got a great idea. Let's take our post office downtown and let's open up a museum about something that doesn't exist. <laughs> Literally, that's <laughs> he put the mob museum together. It's it's uh, but no, he didn't have anything to do with the tour. Um, what, did the city father, what did the city fathers, they're not too happy about it, or though they really, it's a good, it's a good tourist attraction. My gosh, I think oh, it yeah. be a, a big, big attraction. It is. It's a, the, the museum's fantastic. It's uh, three levels uh, in, a, in a basement with a distillery down there. And they have everything, the law enforcement side to the mobster side, and, and, it's, and it's all over from the, all over the country. It's really well put together, and they change it out. They have different things they put on display, including the St. Valentine's Day uh, massacre wall. Massacre. Yeah, with the guns and the bullets and the slugs and all that. It must it must do very well. I would think, I would guess people go to Vegas. You can spend so many time at the tables, you want to do other things. I would bet that you get a lot of people going to that museum. I would put money on that. Sure. And they you know they do that. They, do, they like to do the, the, the tours, go sightseeing. You know, it's more than just sitting in the casinos. I want to say that the gambling doesn't make up anywhere close to what it used to make up as far as the revenue for this town all the really? stores is, oh yeah it's 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 changed quite a bit through the years it has really changed so all right i want to ask you about sam giancana right okay any any run-ins first off any run-ins with oh, sam yeah we, uh, yeah we had of course first of all let's set the scene who some people may not remember who sam giancana was first of all i might add he was killed in gangland style as they say probably the most biggest i think mob yet Oh, that would be the biggest mob hit I think we had in the country at that time. That was 1975. Remember who Sam Giancana was. Mm -hmm. Headed a gang called the 42 Gang when he was a young man on the West Side. But in 1957, uh, Tony Accardo was the boss of the Chicago mob. But uh, Accardo, I think, was getting tired of being the, the headaches that come with that, the government's on your rear end, and so on and so forth. And he voluntarily gave up that position to Sam Giancana so he could spend more time in, in, uh, in Palm Springs and so on and so forth. So for night, from 1957 to about 65, Sam Giancana was boss of the Chicago outfit with no ifs and buts. But he also became well known from publicity shots because of his girlfriend with Dorothy McGuire, with one of the McGuire's, Phyllis McGuire, who was a, the McGuire sisters were a big name. Believe me not, they uh, they had a song called uh, "They Came Out Sincerely." It was very on the charts. They were a great great trio. And Sam had a romantic involvement with uh, Phyllis McGuire, which even, and going out to Vegas and they hung out there. So he, be, he, although he later became, they put him in the black book. That is the book that was put up by the Nevada Gaming Commission for people who could not go in casinos because they were connected to organized crime. So Gene Khan is down. What happens? He's a high man. And all of a sudden the government puts pressure, federal government, let's try to knock him off. And what they did, there's a lot of stories that thought about Gene Khan. They offered him immunity if he would talk about certain things and uh, he would not do it. And so as a result, he was charged in contempt of court. This is in federal court. And we spent 18 months or something like that in the Cook County Jail at that time. Cook County Jail did the uh, handle the federal cases at that point. He spent that time there. And afterwards, he then, because things were getting hot, and I think the mob said, maybe it's time for you to leave. He moved to Mexico. He moved to a suburb of Mexico City called Cuernavaca. He had a very nice home down there. And apparently, he was still trying to run gambling operations from his post in Cuernavaca. That is, he would... Uh, he still get, felt he should get a shot out of what was Chicago doing and some of their international operations. He had something to do as well. In 1974, he got kicked out of the country. The feds put pressure on the Mexican authorities to do that. And he came back. And I remember coming back to the airport. I was not at the airport when he came in. But the next day, he had a, he had a hearing before a judge because at that time, they were this was he was supposed to eventually appear before a congressional committee uh, investigating the story that he and the uh, uh, one other couple other guys were involved in a plot to, to uh, kill Castro, and also he had information on the death of uh, the 1963 murder of, of John President John Kennedy. I remember him coming into that building at uh, the federal building. Now, this may sound cop eyed, but I'm getting punchy, but he looked, first of all, sort of a beaten guy. He went on the elevator, and there were three crews. One of my crews, went, we, I was with him, we all went on the elevator, and they, then the, their attorney punched the wrong door to get out. And it looked, if you ever seen the real Ringling Brothers circuses, everybody would get out, all these clowns would get out, these little Volkswagen, about 30 jammed in there, and it looked just like that. And if I was a mob guy looking at, this is my leader, Jim Connie, he looked like a clown, for God's sake. Well, anyway, it wasn't too long after that that uh, Jim Connie was killed. He went down to, first of all, he went down to Houston. He had some stomach problems. He had some gallbladder surgery down there. So he went down there, and when he came back, at one of the occasions he came back, 
He was having a family get together with two, two of his daughters and their husbands and two of his best friends, Chucky English and Dominic Butch Blasey at his house on, on Winona Avenue in suburban Oak Park. That's where he lived. They had, as it so happened, how do you know that? Because the police intelligence unit there, which was active in those days in organized crime, was parked out in front of his house, checking to see who came in and went out. They were there until the party broke up about 1030 or so, and the two, two daughters with their husbands left, and also Chucky English left, and so did Dominic Butch Blasey. But before they left, they're getting a call in to go some out or some other thing because it looked like this is petered out. There's nothing there. They saw Blazy return to that house, by the way. But Blazy returned the house. They took off. The next thing they knew was a call from police that Oakbrook, the Oakbrook authorities had called that Sam G. and Connie had been murdered in the basement of his own home. That had to happen after the police left the scene until the call came in around 12.30, 12.15, 12.30. Now, G. and Connie had come back from, remember, from Houston. He had gallbladder surgery. When the authorities got on the scene and got in the basement, he'd been cooking some sausage and greens. That meant he, he couldn't have cooked for himself because that would, have, that would have been burned up. He was cooking for someone he knew and trusted. Was there any, any sign of break-in into that house? No. No forcible entry at all. Whoever came in, Giancana, let him come in because Giancana's butler or, or man or whatever you want to call it was upstairs in, in bed at that time. So he had the guy come into the basement. We know that. And then the guy turned the gun and he was shot seven times. Well, that, of course, was a major story because, number one, not who he was, a former major boss with the Chicago mob. But number two, because he was thinking that he was, it could spill evidence on the Kennedy assassination, which I think was baloney. I was told by some government but he knew nothing about that. But anyway, that's why it came a national story. And, John, uh, do you think uh, Tony Accardo did the murder? I think I think the murder had to be approved by Accardo and uh, and Sam and Joey Ayupa. Yeah, do, do you that think had to be authorized? Do you think Accardo anyway, did it? My point, I'm getting, why I'm, I'm showing you, it was not a government job. When they had that funeral of, of Sam Gene Connor, this is June 1975. At that funeral, of course, we come there, we the media and of course the authorities do that as well to get pictures. That's when you see pictures of these guys. None. None of the big shots in the mob showed up to pay homage. There was no Tony Accardo. There was no uh, Joey Ayuba. There was no Jackie Cerrone and so on down the line. The only two guys that came that we knew they were not that was considered active mobster was Chuck English and uh, Bush Blasey, who, was, who actually was Blasey was his driver along with English. They drove him around a lot. And there was a little guy with you, Banano, and one of those guys were there with their kids. I remember that. And there was a couple of celebrities there. I remember Kitty Smith. You may not remember her. She was big in Vegas. Well, that old black magic with her husband, that's a, a, a great number. And Phyllis McGuire was there, but I'll tell you, I did not see Phyllis myself, but the authorities claimed she was there to pay homage to Sam. But the fact that nobody showed up, the word on the street I heard was, stay away. Don't go to that temple. You don't go to that funeral. You're not going to the cemetery. No visitation, nothing. That meant he was in contempt. And that's why I've always convinced that it was a mob hit and had nothing to do with Uncle Sam. That's baloney that people thought that. And as far John, as there's, a rumor, there's a rumor going around that uh, Tony Accardo actually pulled the trigger. I, I find that hard to believe that he do. I didn't think he have to. He, I don't think he needed to do that. Not that Tony would be had no qualms to do it. I don't believe that story. I think it was Blasey. I tell you what happened. That two months later they found the gun. It was a twenty-two, a twenty-two caliber uh, 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 gun that shot. Uh, Pistol that shot uh, Sam Jean Connor was found on a near the, uh, near the river that streams by there, and authorities began to develop what happened. The killer had left Oak Park with that gun when he might have seen a squad car with the Mars lights on, moving fast, hot and running hot, and he might have thought that that cop, gosh, knows that he's looking. They've known Jean Connor's been murdered. He's after me. The guy threw up and did this, rolled down the window and threw the the, the gun out. And by the way, by the time they found it two months later, there were no fingerprints that were usable on there at all. And that would have been the trip that Blasey would have taken back. So Blasey was called before a federal grand jury investigating that thing. He buttoned his lip up and he was used, as these guys call it, a stand-up guy. He did his 18 months and that was it. And so to this day, we don't know for sure who killed Sam Giancana. We can talk about it. We can make speculation. You mentioned Ricardo. Some people think Spilatro. But bear in mind... He might have let Cardo in. He would have never let uh, uh, Tony Spilato in his house. So, oh, no, he wouldn't be that dumb. And he was pretty streetwise, uh, Sam was. There's no question about that. But Blasey, as I said, remember, was seen by the police going into that house. And then they left. The others, he, he went originally left, and then he came back. 
whether it's Butch Blasi or not, but all of most knowledgeable investigators I talked to figure it's Butch that pulled the trigger. Butch and I did never, never was charged. Nobody was ever charged on me. So it's an unsolved case. But it's probably the biggest, I think, mob hit we've had here in Chicago, bigger than the Spilatro hit. But that was the biggest one, I think, of all. That, uh, as I say, has not been cleared, but uh, people still talk a lot about it. And when he used to give speeches, I'd go, wasn't the one question that was always asked? Who killed Sam Gene Connor? That was a big question that was asked for years. It did happen in 1975. But it's still a mystery. And for you Hawkshaws listening or viewing in right now, I don't know if there's any reward, but if you are a Hawkshaw, you might be able to, if you solve that, buddy, you're on air in like Flint, they used to say. <laughs> How about Felix Aldericio? Gus, Alex, Harry Ailman? Well, Phil Aldericio was the guy they called Milwaukee Phil. He was a feared man. He died, by the way, not of violence. He died of a heart attack uh, in 1971. He was doing time, believe it or not, where you know he was doing time at Marion. He was stricken when he was down in Marion. But he was considered uh, an enforcer. Among other things, he's also a great scam artist. He's involved in bankrupt, phony bankruptcy deals and that. They also used him as, a, as an enforcer, and they think he would, uh, was responsible for a number of murders with his partner. His partner's name was Chucky Nicoletti, the two of them together. You don't want to see them in the headlight. If you see them behind you, you got problems. I'll tell you. If you're driving around at night, if Chuck, <laughs> Chucky and Milwaukee Fuller behind me in the car, say, "Oh, I got, I got real problems now." <laughs> I'll tell you. But uh, he died of natural causes. He lived in Riverside, Elder did. and uh, he was a, he was obviously a cardinal. Those people thought very highly of him. He was very very highly thought of in those circles. Nicoletti, on the other hand, an interesting story happened there. After. Uh, Phil died. I remember I covered the story at the North Lake Steakhouse in suburban North Lake. Got out there for a murder, and who's in the who'd been shot? Chucky Nicoletti himself. It was slumped over the wheel. And to this day, there's another unsolved murder. Nicoletti and Elder Rizzo were, were real tough enforcers. I'll tell you that. The story was again unconfirmed that that he had come across. Chris double crossed somebody with the Milwaukee mob, Frank Bellisteri's place up there, and they came down and shot and killed him. Whether that's true or not, that's just probably a wild theory. But that case has never been cleared either. That, that's a, that was the major uh, mob, mob, mob hit. And I remember we got a, one thing about it is that that good steakhouse. So we darted in there for a steak at noon, and the owner came over after. He says, "I don't mind your business, guys, but the next time you have to bring that truck there because we parked that big you know, that big uh, big unit in front of the restaurant. That was tra- apparently apparently turned some of his people away." <laughs> <laughs> but we had a great steak out of it anyway. <laughs> Nicoletti again, unsolved. Who did that? We don't know. There's plenty of mystery. I talked about Hawks. You guys, if you are Hawks, does, you got plenty to do to get uh, you clear those murders and you're going to be A1 in anybody's book. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> I think that this has been floating now, around. Now, who did you, you asked about a couple other guys in yeah, yeah. Phil, but I mentioned, I mentioned Nicoletti because they were, they were like Siamese twins together, so I had to do that. Gus Alex, a lot of people are asking about him. Well, Gus Alec was sort of a, uh, he was a smooth, he, he was the Bob's liaison to judges and, and prominent businessmen. He was the type of guy that was uh, could get along. He's no, no Dems and Dozers. He could get along with the higher echelon people. So he was, he was also a Greek. He was never really part of the mob in that sense. He was not a made man. But he was the guy that uh, they looked for, that is, the Cardo and company would look for to do, you know, work with judges and say you had to. Here's the judge you ought to vote for. Once the judge gets in, he said, "Here's we want to convict this guy or call this case is no this civil case is no good. Throw it out." So, so he was their lies and man. And he had a good person who lived with a nice his wife. I remember with a German-born gal. They lived on Lakeshore Drive in the winter and the summer rather. And then in the winter they uh, lived down in Florida. So he lived high off the hog, and he was uh, finally was arrested and convicted and died in prison. Uh, Carl Walsh, by the way, was his lawyer who was also a Cardo's lawyer. But what happened was he was. Uh, he was spearheading a, a gang of, of extortion artists, including Lenny Patrick, Jimmy LaValle, and several others that were shaking down bars, restaurants, and car dealerships. But Agus, he, I mean, Alex was, even though Alex was not involved directly with it, it was his baby. They paid off to him. And I remember him coming in the federal building when he was on trial. You could see he was not, it was not put on. He was walking very, very slow, like I do now. And uh, he was not well anymore. And then I say he succumbed when he was in prison. But he was sort of the mob's liaison man. With the, he had the same type of deal as Murray the Campbell Humphreys did before. Murray the Campbell Humphreys, a Welshman, was a guy that was also, this is before Alex, who had a deal, who would deal with the business community, deal with judges. He, would know, he was, wore a camel, camel or coat. He looked very, very, very affluent. Very looked like well-educated and so on and so forth. 
and he was arrested in 65, and I think he died of a heart attack right after that, if I recall. Yeah, he was sick him when the cops and feds came to arrest him, and then he uh, he later died of a heart attack. So so Gus Alex succeeded him in that role. And then Alex, as I say, his career ended when he was convicted on that shakedown scheme with Lenny Patrick and Jamila Valley and some of those guys. And I think he died in prison. I don't think he got out. Did you ever interview Al Palato after his attempted at assassination? Yeah, there's a guy. I'm glad you mentioned Al Palato. Very congenial guy. He um, he was the boss of the. Uh, he was a labor's union guy, but more importantly, he was from Chicago, from the Heights, Chicago Heights, and he really ran this, the South Suburban uh, Outfit Syndicate. No question about that. And the story about him is incredible. His brother, by the way, I'll give you a story on that. I can't vouch for 100% sure, but I think it's true. In uh, 72, I think it was, with a guy named Guido Fidenzi. <laughs> he was a juice loan guy. Got shot to death in a gas, a, a, a Standard Oil. That's right. They used to call him Standard Oil. This is before BP guys. Standard Oil Station, Chicago Heights. We went down to do the story, and good Fidenzi apparently got out of his car, realized these guys are after me, raced, ran into the men's room of the Standard Oil Station, and was shot to death. Now, this story I, I was told at the time that not one, not one Chicago Heights police car was on the street at that time it happened. In other words, somebody knew it and was going to advance. And by the way, Pilato's brother was the chief of uh, Chicago Heights police at that time. I think that was him. I remember. <laughs> Pilato himself was a vigorous guy. He was later he was later convicted in a scheme down in Miami, Florida, uh, a scheme involving uh, the uh, dental insurance program with the Teamsters. And he got this, or I'm sorry, with the labor's union. And I remember going down, I saw that when they indicted the guy, and I saw him, and he had his age in the 70s. I said, that's wrong. I told the government, I said, the guy can't be that old. And he was. For a man of his age, he looked incredibly healthy. And he was very personable. In fact, uh, I'll be honest with you, I, I ran into him, my crew, at a, in a restaurant uh, in uh, Florida when we were down for that trial, which was about six days we were down there. And uh, we sent him over a drink, and he was very polite about that. But he would always talk to you. Pilato was not a guy that would run away, could photograph him, no problem at all. He would not obviously talk about his problems with the mob and so on and so forth. But what really the most famous thing maybe about him now was he's playing golf. This to as a golfer, this is this to me is a sacrilege. He's playing golf at this course in the South Suburbs, maybe around Creed, I don't know where. Some guy comes out of the woods with a gun and shoots him while he's playing golf. They thought they killed him, but he survived. He went to St. James Hospital in Chicago Heights and survived. And the guy must have been told the mob was hired up for a bit at that time. And all, you know how the guy escaped? On a, on a bike. That's right, on a bike, and they caught him. But we never found out for real why he was shot, why they were trying to kill him. One of the stories was, because also on trial with Pilato down there in Florida, was Tony Ricardo. And people thought, one of the theories was that Ricardo was enraged that he got involved in a scam, and his name was on it, and they thought the Palato, who was the head man on that on that on the scam apparently, had dragged him into it, and so uh, Ricardo was uh, very PO'd, and he wanted him hit. Then we had another story that uh, there was a, 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 a problem with the Chicago Heights mob. I think uh, Caesar Taco wanted to take over one of the stories, and he was hired some guys, and they wanted to get rid of Palato. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. So there we go again, another shooting incident, and Palato couldn't shed any light. He could shed light on it, but he didn't. Uh, but anyway, there's another story that uh, in the in the history book, so to speak. And again, nobody. Well, the guy was arrested. The guy on the bike was arrested. I think his name was Daniel Bounds. I think I remember right. Yeah, he was arrested. But he couldn't shed any light as to why he did it. That was that was the funny part of it. I always wanted to know whether the guys continued to play golf or not. I would have. I'd, or, and of course, it would be that is right. True, and I paid good money to play golf just because when the guys got shot. That doesn't mean I have to quit. <laughs> whether they did or not, I don't know. <laughs> My friends told me. That uh, Al Palato ducked and rolled after he got shot. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I put those names you're bringing up. Uh, that alone, you know, those names we don't hear up anymore. They passed away, but they were in the height when the, the heyday of the mob. There's no question about it. And there were leadership positions. No question about that. Labor's union at that time was pretty well controlled by, by the outfit. Vince Solano was the head guy at, at that time, up in the, in the union up in, in the city of Chicago. Vince Solano was. Wasn't and he was there, by the way, if you're talking about Stales out of school, supposedly was the one who orchestrated the hit on Kenny Edo. That Pilato was the guy that said, look, I mean, the, not Pilato, Solano, Vince Solano, S-O-L-A-N-O, had felt that this guy, we couldn't trust Edo to talk, he was going to talk, so we got to get rid of him. And of course, Edo was a stand-up guy. That was a big mistake. And, and he did talk. Yeah, he tried to kill him. You can't blame Edo. Say, hey, I can play this game too then. And by the way, there is a mystery. The people that shot... Uh, Again, you guys are hawkshaws. The guys that shot the, the people that tried to kill Edo, Jasper Campisi, 
and a guy named John Cattuso uh, were killed themselves. They found them in a trunk near Naperville. It was around 1983, whenever it was. In that case, has never been solved. And by the way, it shows again that the mob uses what I call sleepers. People say, who did these hit men? They always think of certain guys, at Harry and Butch and things like that. They did the, you'd be surprised that the guys look at uh, how in the case of the family secret case, you know, most uh, law enforcement people did not think that Nick Calabrese was involved in any homicides and look how many homicides he was involved in. And in the case of, uh, of Gattuso, who was along with Campisi killed, he was a, he was a sheriff with the Cook County Sheriff's Department. And it turned out he was used as with uh, with uh, Jasper Campisi to try to kill Canetto. And uh, what happened, by the way, for this time, I'm going in this story backwards since we brought it up to your listeners. Edo had been charged with it on a gambling charge. He was a big uh, gambling guy for the mob. He, he ran what they called the Belita racket at one time, which was big in the Puerto Rican community. And then he expanded to other fields. And he got charged with with uh, with, get, with uh, this gambling charge. And uh, the authorities apparently in the mob felt, hey. We can't trust Edo. He's going to squeal. I never would have been a stand-up guy. I don't believe he would have ever done that. So they decided to get rid of him. And Jasper Campisi and John Petuso were assigned to take care of Mr. Edo. So they said that Vin Solano, that's the story I heard, wanted to meet them for dinner. And that uh, they picked him up and stopped over on Grand Avenue there. And uh, before, I don't know what was going on, the guy in the back seat, Petuso, tried to shoot. He shot him several times with a twenty-two. And he survived. That's incredible. So he survived, bleeding as he was. He was he feigned he was dead. And so the Capizzi and uh, Gattuso got out of the car and fled. And by the way, I may be wrong. I want to take that back. We don't know if there's Solano. Solano certainly wanted to make sure that, that uh, Edo didn't talk, whether he set that meeting up. I don't know. But according to Edo, that he was going to meet uh, uh, Solano that night. And these guys were driving him there. But they panicked, went out. Uh, what's his name? Uh, Kenny Edo staggered off when they were gone, staggered across the street to a uh, drugstore and came bleeding into the pharmacy and said, call 911, call 911. And that was a circus. They called 911. And the person who took the call, it's like it was just, he had a scratch in the rear end or something. He said, what is this all about? When did it happen? Oh, God. 911 did not look good that night. I'll tell you that much. The guy's bleeding to this. And they were asking all these questions like it was nothing happened. But anyway, came, the authorities then, after Campisi, and Edo, and as you were, Campisi and, and uh, the sheriff's deputy had botched the job. The authorities said, look, you guys, because they arrested him. You, you guys, if you go down on bond, don't go down on bond. You cooperate. If you get on bond, you're going to be killed. And Campisi, who lived in River Forest, apparently at one time was a good friend of Tony Accardo, said, no, nah, that's baloney. He's a good friend of Accardo. Accardo would not allow that to happen. And lo and behold, uh, and soon after they got on a bond, they, were, they, they disappeared. And later, as I said, their bodies were found in the trunk of a car out near Naperville. And so they paid the price. They goofed up on that assignment. The assignment was to kill Edo. They didn't do it, and they had to pay the price. That was a really interesting story. I mean, the guy had a hard head, but bullets were bouncing off of it. That's a... Oh, my gosh, that's incredible that Edo... <laughs> John, did you know that Johnny Cattuso load, loaded those 22 rounds? They were, they were half loads? They were using 22. Well, some of the theory was when it... The, the bullet, one of the bullets was defective. It, the, 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 the automatic may have uh, misfired or whatever it was. But he was shot. He was he was bleeding pretty badly. He had been definitely shot at least. Uh, had two bullets in his head. So they were half was, loads, though. They just went underneath the skull, uh, skull. Never went through. But yeah, they were in the skull area. That's where. Yeah, they didn't hit him in the neck or in the heart or anything like that. It was all in the skull. So he had a pretty tough skull to begin with, I guess. Signals. But, and then Edo, Edo, then he then he cooperated. He was running around the country with, he looks like a, I have him a robe. He came and testified before a Senate committee here in Chicago. And of course he was all masked up. They had him look like a, a kind of, he had a robe over his head uh, and uh, a robe and a mask over his head. You couldn't see who it was. So he traveled around there. It was great television because people love to see that stuff. So they, the, the, the government got a lot of mileage out of that. And he named a lot how the mob was running. So things of that nature, but more of a show, it was a, show, it was a showcase deal. And I always wondered, by the way, that'd be a great movie about Edo. He really would. It would play in Chicago. Never, it's never happened. The Japanese government did do a documentary on it. I know that because yeah. I was interviewed on it. But yeah. I thought that that would be Chicago. That could sell. But it's never never played here at all. Never played here at all. Yeah, what what a story. And then he wanted he wanted Elaine Smith as the agent. He was the, yeah, the, he was the FBI agent. And yeah, we, we, we had Elaine on the show and interviewed her before. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. She's a, she's a wonderful, wonderful woman. And uh, a heck of a memory, but interesting that he wanted her, you know, no one else. 
her. He trusted really? her, you know. So she talked yeah. a lot, she talked a lot about Edo and all that. You had a lot of. I hope it wasn't boring you, but no, you know, like no, 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 no. It's fascinating. All you, everything coming out of, out of your mouth is fascinating. Well, <laughs> Jen, how many, way, how many movies were you in? Cooperated. The question: How was, many movies were you in? We all wonder what happened to him. And I remember he had a, a guy named Mr. Tom was one of his associates in that uh, gambling racket that he ran. And I saw him over at Manny's Cafeteria one time. I always talked to him once in a while, and I asked him, where, it, where do you think Ken Edo went? And he said he, he claimed he didn't know, and I don't think he did, but he surmised that he was in Brazil. Now, whether he said why he said that or not, I don't know. But it turned out, he, I think he was down in Atlanta, Georgia. So that's where he died. I think he was actually got a different name and so on and moved to Atlanta, Georgia, and then he died some years back. He's dead now, of course. So, John, you were, uh, I, re I remember seeing you in the movie The Fugitive, but speaking of yes. the documentary you did for the, the Japanese documentary, but w what other movies were you in? Well, the Chain Reaction, and then I was in uh, with Owen with uh, Siegel's first movie. Uh, what the heck was that about? No, was that the Above the Law? I think it was. Yeah, there was three movies. Unfortunately, I didn't get the bidding that I thought that I should have, but I'll say this much in the movie uh, Fugitive, with, of course, uh, Harrison Ford, Tommy Lee Jones, etc. The first voice you hear on that show, if you sit back and watch it sometime, they show the scene at the uh, at the apartment where the uh, the one armed man is trying to kill his wife, yeah. and he arrives on the scene. First voice you hear is yours truly on that show. You'll hear my voice on that. And a funny story how that. Uh, I'll give you a quick story. If we got time to go into about a thirty-nine second story. Or yeah, of course, right? of course. Well, what happened was, I remember when I had Andy Davis as director, I arrived on the site, but they told me, get down at 3 o'clock. We shot it uh, right off of uh, the Armitage down there, about 2000 north. And I got down there at 3 o'clock, and they gave me the script, and some guy, producer comes up. He says, now, what you do is you, you memorize that stuff, all right? You go, I said, yes, sir, I will. I sat there and sat there about 6 o'clock. He said, how you doing? Well, I'd, I, when are we going to go? Well, it'll be a little while yet. At 9 o'clock, he comes by again. He says, hey, it's time to eat. Boy, those guys on the crew ate good. We had a swordfish steak that night. Not bad <laughs> at that point. Then I come back to the cabin, to the uh, trailer, and all of a sudden, it knocks on the door. He said, this is it. You know your lines. I said, I know my lines. I go up to the scene where they're getting ready to shoot it. And, and Andrew Davis was the uh, director. And he said, Drummond, you know your lines. Yes, sir, Mr. Davis. I know them all. I'm ready to go. He said, shit can them. I said, what? Shit can the lions. You just arrived on the scene. You don't know what's really going on. That's accurate. You don't when you go on to the scene like that as a rule. He said, all you know is this doctor, he named the doctor that uh, his, uh, was at a banquet down in the uh, uh, Four Seasons Hotel. He comes back and what he says, he sees a one-armed man or somebody grappling with his wife and so on and so forth. That's his story. The guy gets away and we're going to take him into custody and question him. All right, let's get ready to roll. And so we winged that. That, inter that thing when I did that live shot, was supposed to be, I was supposed to look like a guy that didn't have much information on it, which is realistic. When some reporters go on the scene, you don't know. They just throw that mic on you fast. And I gave that fragmentary information that David showed me. And they, we did it in one take. That was one take. Wow. I, that was all. We, we, well, I, all that work memorizing, all that work memorizing on those lines, I said, I'm going to be perfect. I'm going to fluff one line. And they didn't use it in any of it. That's life in the big city, though. I guess you got to put up with it. <laughs> That's awesome. We're all going to watch. Uh, I bet you everybody's going to pull up the movie tonight and <laughs> watch the beginning well, of it. Well, that's a good movie. Seriously, all kidding aside, that is a very good movie. It was oh. shot in Chicago. Good cast. Great scenes of Chicago in there. Great, yes. great scenes. Great character actors. That is a very good film. And didn't Jones get there? Was it Jones that got the uh, some kind of a uh, supporting actor role? I think he did. He got, he, he got an award. Uh, Tommy Lee, Tommy Lee Jones. Yeah, yeah, Tommy Lee Jones. That's correct. Yes. Yeah, that's yeah. that's that's the sign of a pro when you can when when you can just wing it and do it and nobody knows. That's that's it. You know. Uh, one of the best lines of that show they took out of me. Uh, Davis came up to me and one of the scenes in that movie, you may recall that uh, the fugitive played by Harrison Ford is spotted in the. Uh, the, the Daily Center or the, uh, the county building that they're together, as you know, and he runs down the stairs and uh, Jones follows him and shoots him. He's going through the truce at him when he goes through the doors, miss, shatters the glass and everything. And I said to Davis, I said, the only problem is I don't think a marshal would take a chance and start firing wildly in the lobby of the uh, you know, city hall like that. He could be in bad trouble like that. So we'll ask him about that because uh, that scene was good. Why did you do that? And uh, 
Davis, I mean, Jones got a little hot about that. And that's what Davis wanted him to do, get hot. So I felt, I said, well, he got hot. He said, that, that's great, great. It never made the air. They put, what they say, the cutting room floor that went. So maybe yeah. maybe Jones objected to that and uh, never made the air, but and never made the show the show. But it was it's been a good scene being there, damn it, if I do say so. All right, last question, John. Where'd you get your nickname, Bulldog? Who gave it to you? Well, actually, it was not... People think there was a detective, an English detective by the name of Bulldog Roman. Mm -hmm. But that was not the reason why, because they never called me that name at all in other places I worked until I went to BBM. And I also worked at IND, of course, and other place, Rockford, you name it. And uh, somebody called me, started calling me Bull, and made it a column or made it a bulldog because of, cause supposedly I was so determined and hard, uh, not let up trying to get a story. It was, it was a guy that was would not like a bull, a grip of a bulldog. He would not give up, and not, that's how I get the nickname. Even though people, some of people, real old people now, think he must have been named after the English detective bulldog Drummond, but that's not true. That thing didn't come up until I worked here, and was not because of the the, the, the English uh, detective at all. <laughs> wow, what a coincidence, though, that there was a John the Bulldog Drummond. Yes, and there were also I mean, they it's... made, and there were several movies of several. It was a series yeah. of movies made out also Bulldog Drummond. Be yeah. movies they were, but <laughs> that's going back to the '30s, so that goes back a long time. <laughs> yeah, it does. Well, John, hey. so several people have asked, "Where did you first meet me?" Where did I first meet Red? Yeah. Well, I met Red. Uh, of course, uh, Red was. We talked on the phone way before you ever met me. <laughs> What's that? We talked on the phone. Telephone. Yes, you did. Way That's before you met me. Yeah, it was not unusual. I knew that Red had a adult bookstore on Wall Street. I knew that he was under pressure by certain members of the uh, underworld society to come up with money, and his name soon figured. And we did, we did uh, meet, and we of course it turned out to be a nice relationship as far as I was concerned. We covered his trial when he was up against when he testified against Frankie Schweiss. A lot of people don't remember that he testified against a very famed killer, in 1989, and Schweiss was convicted mainly because of, uh, of Red's testimony. And what uh, I'll probably- We had a wonderful dinner at the Columbian. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, well, I was gonna, okay. we're, we're running, I guess we're running late. I was giving the whole story, yeah, yeah, we're well over the hour time. We'll, I'll tell you what we'll do, sometime we'll get together and then we'll tell you about the Red, uh, how they set up that camera. I'm sure you've brought, you heard about it before, but it might be from a neutral observer. Let me tell you the story sometime, okay? When we have the time hey. to talk about Red doing the video, okay? That would be awesome, John. Would you would you come back on again and uh, have we'll, another? We'll, we'll come out of the wilderness one more time for you if you need it. But if the people want it, demand it. Though I mean, they could, this get some of this stuff might be getting a little old by then. But some of these older stories, but they're they're still fresh, borrowed but blue. But they're fresh as new mown hay. Yet, those stories are, I think. <laughs> No, John, we have comments on here that are saying number three, round three. <laughs> right, everybody, yeah, everybody yeah, wants yeah, a round. Red will talk to me, calls me periodically. We'll try to set up a time. Okay, that'll okay. be sometime. All right, we'll definitely Take it do easy, that. Guys, out in Vegas, and we'll, and we'll see you guys later. Stay, stay cool. All right, bye now. Thanks, John. Bye bye. Hey, Red, have a great day, everybody. It's been fun, mob vlog.